Hello, welcome. I am Narielle Davis, a librarian with Vancouver Island Regional Library's Cowichan Branch. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples of each of the communities in our service area and represented by those watching today. I am coming to you from the land of the Cowichan tribe, whose relationship with the land continues to this day. I am very excited to be speaking today with Bill, Bill Bernier from Canada Planetarium. Bill was born and raised in Vancouver and studied at both the Langara College and the University of British Columbia. He began his career as a print journalist with a strong interest in a space science writing. Since then, Bill has been an astronomy educator, outreach organizer, and planetarium operator. Highly interactive work with the public that has spanned more than 30 years. In 1985, Bill joined the part-time staff of Vancouver's H.R. McMillan Planetarium now the H.R. McMillan Space Centre, to conduct its annual Community Astronomy Summer Stargazing Tour of British BC Provincial Parks. He subsequently became a lecturer operator at McMillan's Zeese Planetarium Star Theatre. In 2004, he was asked to direct educational activities for the teaching planetarium at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. Bill also became the first portable planetarium operator in the province. Currently, Bill is the manager of planetarium services for Canadian planetariums in Burnaby, BC. He is also an instructor in the liberal arts and adult 55 plus program at Simon Fraser University. A keen observer of the night sky, Bill's deep interest in telescopes, celestial observing, and communicating astronomy has been lifelong. He remains a frequent contributor to NOVA, the newsletter of Vancouver Center Royal Astronomy Society, Astronomical Society of Canada. Thank you, Bill, for being here with us today. Oh, thank you, Naro. Thank you uh, for having me. And I'm, I'm glad to be uh, uh, speaking to people on the island uh, or have many fond memories of observing in places uh, like uh, Pacific Rim National Park and um, Raft Trevor Provincial Park and uh, Miracle Beach. I used to uh, travel to those parks with a telescope and um, put up the telescope in the park and then there'd be a slide talk at evening and then all the campers would come and look through the big telescope at the uh, nighttime sky. But uh, right now I'm kind of uh, confined to home, right? Because of uh, various changes that I suppose everyone knows about, but uh, that doesn't stop the interest in astronomy. So everyone uh, watching this is potentially uh, the manager of an observatory, which is your backyard, or your home, or even out a window, right? So you can do astronomy as well. Um, it's not complicated, it's not difficult, it's not, uh, uh, doesn't require graduate uh, training or a grant from the National Research Council. You can be your own uh, astronomer and do, uh, do astronomy from your, uh, from your own home. An example of that has come up. Um, I know that uh, many people wonder about, you know, I don't have a telescope or something like that, or could I have a telescope or how do you get a telescope? Well, I knew someone who uh, had a two-year-old who was quite active and they played with a pair of binoculars and smashed them, right? So you got a broken pair of binoculars. But what I did was I took off the front element of the binocular, the part that uh, sees, there's the uh, glass right there. So there's the front element, the lens of a pair of binoculars, right? And, and then I also unscrewed at the other end, the part where you look through, the eyepiece. So this is the eyepiece of the same pair of binoculars. So we've got the objective lens and the eyepiece of a binocular. Now a telescope is just a tube that holds these things together. So going to the store, I bought this. This uh, They sell this for about $4 a foot, right? And so there's only eight inches here. First thing I did was take the lens outside and project the image of the sun onto a cardboard and measure the distance. And it turned out to be about uh, 200 millimeters, so that, about eight inches. So that's the focal length of this lens. The focal length of the little lens is about 27 millimeters. And so the gap between them must be the sum of those two uh, uh, numbers. So sure enough, I cut this with a saw. Right? And when the objective lens goes in here, now I can just um, touch the edge up with, with some uh, crazy glue or something to keep it in. And then on the other end, 
there's a connector. These are from the uh, uh, from the uh, hardware department. So this is a connector that goes in this one, and it has a bit of a thread. So you can focus your telescope, because that's what's going to be your own little telescope. By turning this, you change the distance and therefore can focus on things that are close by or far away. Right? And then the lens goes in there. Right? The whole thing goes together. And now you have yourself a little telescope. Right? It magnifies about seven times and has a two inch glass. So it gives you a lot more light gathering power. So with this, you can get started in astronomy. The uh, optics may mean that the, uh, the, the subject is seen upside down. So when you look through the little telescope, you'll be surprised to see things are upside down, but that's how things naturally are, right? Uh, according to the optics group perform this. In a pair of binoculars, there are prisms which flip the image over, so you have right side up. But for astronomy, it doesn't make much difference. So you can, um, you can get started uh, with your astronomy, finding things like the Andromeda galaxy, uh, find the locations of star clusters, colored double stars, many, many things like this can be seen with a simple telescope. It's not necessary to spend great amounts of money or, uh, or shop um, you know, for, for adver advertising uh, on the internet and, and uh, things like this. There's no need for that at all. Um, if you have an old pair of binoculars that work or um, a pair that are broken and you can take the parts of it, if you're a little bit handy, right, um, if you can do arts and crafts and make things, then uh, you can make a telescope. In fact, some kids, when we did this in a classroom, they got a piece of paper and drew stars and comets and things like that on it and then rolled the paper around the tube and glued it on so they had their individual telescope with their own artwork on it. So that, that's kind of cool. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, what's going on right about now? This month in October is the, uh, is the month of a blue moon. Now you may say, well, does that mean the moon's gonna turn blue? No, a blue moon means there's two uh, moons, in, two full moons in one month. So October 1st was a full moon and the 30th will also be a full moon. All right, so we have two full moons within side October, and that's called a blue moon. The reason for that is that it doesn't happen very often. I think the next time this happens is in 2024, sometime in August. But um, it's a rare event, and the rare event uh, happens simply because the months are slightly longer than the period between two full moons. So sometimes you can crowd two full moons into the same month, and this is what is meant by a blue moon. If the moon looks blue, which I suppose it can sometimes, that's because there's a lot of particulate matter in the atmosphere. So but that's a different issue. That has to do with, uh, with uh, um, atmospheric um, optics and things like that and the scattering of light. But uh, the moon will look normal, won't, won't look blue, but it will be a blue moon. That's just a label for it, a name. So, um, you know, the moon is kind of interesting. And I sometimes look at it with my little telescope or the one behind me, which is, uh, just in the field of view, I believe. Uh, there's, a, there's a telescope there behind me. So I take this out and look at the moon. And um, the full moon is very, very bright. But it's not often um, appreciated that the half moon is not half as bright as the full moon. It's, a, it's about a tenth as bright. So even though half the moon is showing, it's only about 10% as bright as the full moon. And why is that? Well, if the moon, I've got my, uh, my cup here, I've got, if the moon was like this, this is a ping pong ball. If the moon was like a ping pong ball, then when it was half, you'd see half as much light. But that's not the case. In fact, it's only about 10%. So the moon is not like a ping pong ball. It is more like a golf ball. And because a golf ball shines like that. Now, what's the difference between a ping pong ball and a golf ball? Well, doesn't a golf ball have little kind of hills in it and mountains and little, little valleys all over it? It's sort of wrinkled. And this wrinkling means that when light shines on it, a lot of the light is scattered away and or is hidden or is scattered inside one of the little craters. So this means <clears throat> that the moon's surface is like a golf ball, not like a ping pong ball. And we could tell this 
even if for some reason it were impossible to look at the moon's surface in a telescope and see what it's like. So just the way that it, the moon reflects light, right, indicates its surface is wrinkly and hilly with valleys and, uh, and discrepancies and all over the place. It's not flat like a ping pong ball. <clears throat> now, sometimes astronomers uh, look at objects that are very far away, like asteroids or uh, or bodies that are very far, far away. And in the telescope, they still look just like a tiny dot. Right? So you can't see their surface like the moon. But if they scatter light in certain ways, it tells the astronomers what the surface is like. So this same uh, motif is applied to very distant objects and allows us to find out where, uh, you know, what the surface of these bodies are like. So this was used to find out surface conditions on uh, comets and asteroids, including uh, bodies that have been visited by uh, spacecraft like the uh, uh, OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, which is uh, currently right above a little asteroid. Now the asteroid looks like a, a dot in a telescope, but a great deal of information was known about it before the spacecraft arrived based on scattering of light uh, and other things like that. So we find out things about these bodies before we go there. And uh, so sometimes there are surprises, but oftentimes uh, we have a good understanding of what's going to what's going to be found when the spacecraft finally arrives. Well, <clears throat> speaking of the moon, there's going to be um, a lunar eclipse on uh, November 30th, so that's coming up uh, about a month from now. The lunar eclipse is when the moon. Well, let's um, get the moon and the Earth here. <clears throat> Okay, here's the moon and here's the earth. Now, what happens is the earth, does that look like the earth? It's, I'm probably upside down. But anyway, there's the earth there. And we're on the earth, right? I don't think anyone will disagree with that. Even the flat earth people won't disagree with it. We're on the earth, okay? <clears throat> okay, so there's the earth right there. Now, the earth um, has a big shadow that comes out from it. That shadow is shaped like an ice cream cone. At the opposite end of the shadow, way far away, is the sun. So this ice cream cone shaped shadow, more than a million kilometers long, goes out behind the Earth. And in a lunar eclipse, the moon moves into that when it's full and is uh, temporarily darkened. So the moon will look reddish or dark brown or some, some such uh, color like that. So this happens when the moon moves in. It happens about twice a year and November 30th will be the next time. So <clears throat> what you'll see on the 30th, and um, <clears throat> it's a good, a good idea to get uh, sort of used to what the moon looks like now. So where you are from your own home, go outside. And uh, when it's nice and clear, hopefully tonight, um, turn and look towards the east. When the sun goes down in the west, the full moon comes up in the east. And get used to sort of what it looks like and how bright it is. Then um, a month from now, about the 30th, the same thing will happen. But the moon will look darkened. Um, probably after 11 or 12 o'clock at night. So this is a sort of an early morning uh, eclipse. So when the moon is high in the sky, it will look funny. It will look like uh, it's covered in copper or dark brown or ochre or some such color like that. And that's because the moon is now wandering through the shadow of the earth. And in a few hours, it reemerges and looks uh, back to where it normally does. Now, if you take a, a curved object like the, the lid of a, a jam jar and hold it up over the moon and try to, try to find the curve, try to copy the curve of the shadow of the earth, you'll find the shadow of the earth is a circle against the moon, but it's bigger than the moon because the moon is much smaller than the earth. So this ice cream cone shaped shadow propagates out into space, and you can see its shadow on the Earth as a sort of a curve, a portion of a circle. This means that the Earth must be round. Again, the, the flat Earth people are over on me all the time. We've got hate mail and all that, oh boy. And uh, well, what happens is the Earth must be round like a ball because a round ball is the only shape that can cast a ice cream cone shaped shadow, like a cone, right? So no other shape will do that. Therefore, in early times, um, even in the times of the ancient Greeks, it was understood that the earth was round like a ball. It's just that no one really understood how big the ball was. There were a few measurements of it, and some of these were quite accurate, but there were also inaccurate measurements and also a problem uh, in, the, uh, in the unit used, a stadia, 
was is an ancient uh, unit, but there were two different types of stadia, a long one and a short one. So when it was said there were so the earth of uh, the circumference of the earth is so many stadia, you had two values you could choose between a big earth, which is approximately the right answer for the size of the earth, and then a little earth that was much, much littler, about 40% the size of the real earth. So when Christopher Columbus approached uh, the royalty in Europe to get money to fund his trip across the Atlantic Ocean, he decided it would seem better if he chose the smaller Earth to sell his idea, because then it didn't seem to be so far uh, between Europe and Asia, right? Just a little ways, not very far. But in fact, he, he calculated about 3,000 miles to, from Europe to uh, Japan. The, the, the actual distance is like 13,000 miles, so a little bit out there, right? So, <clears throat> but Christopher Columbus chose the littler Earth, got his funding, sailed the ships across the Atlantic. <clears throat> and when he got <clears throat> to the West Indies, he assumed he was off the coast of Japan, which he found the mainland of Japan was the island of Hispaniola with the, the modern nation of Haiti. So when he was there, he was convinced he was on the uh, Japanese mainland. And then the next big body of land he found, Cuba, he assumed was the mainland of Asia and uh, Chinese. Well, so, but he met a, um, a local there, a, 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 a local inhabitant on Cuba, and this person told them that he believed he lived on an island, although a large island, and when Columbus heard this, he was furious, because he, that's not what he wanted to hear, and so he uh, got all his officers of his ships together, and he made them swear a solemn oath that when we get back to Spain, everyone will say we have been on the mainland of Asia and not in some other weird place. Well, that ha that didn't hold very well because he made a couple more trips and found out the truth that for some bizarre reason, there was a huge land mass of all sorts of uh, places in between Europe and Asia. And uh, the navigator on the ship was a fellow named Amerigo. And so these he named these, uh, uh, these places America, right? So that's how that goes, it's as simple as that. Well, so you see a little measurement, a little bit of confusion has um, quite great consequences. And history seems to move like this, a history of errors um, adding up to the modern world we have today. You might say it's, it's based on a billion errors. <laughs> okay, well, so the eclipse will, will be happy. You don't need any um, special equipment. And I know solar eclipses um, are sometimes hazardous because um, you're looking at the bright sun, but the sun's not in the neighborhood here. So it's perfectly safe to go outside and enjoy the eclipse of the moon. Again, without any uh, without any things that are needed. Okay, so um, speaking of the sun, <clears throat> something I like to do is watch um, the sun move through clouds. And um, if you look at the up at the sun, you see the, the clouds moving against it. But if you look at a, its reflection in the water, you'll see that um, you can see much more of the clouds because the image is dimmer. But I have over here. Okay, so I should have put this on the table. Before. This is, I don't know if anyone recognizes this. What do you suppose this is? This is a what's called a purse mirror. I guess um, it's, if you're uh, if you carry a purse, you'll probably know what this is. So it's a little per mirror for inspecting makeup, which uh, ladies keep in their purse. That's what I understand. I don't have any like, direct knowledge of this, but anyway, they're only a dollar. I picked up a couple at the Looney Store. Now I can go outside, and when the atmosphere is right, I see the moon sliding through clouds, and we've got lots of clouds here on the West Coast. So I take the little pocket mirror and reflect the image of the sun onto the wall of a shed or the side of a building, maybe six, 50, 60 yards away. That picture of the sun is perfectly round, even though the mirror is not round. Sometimes people suspect they're going to see an image that's like the mirror, but no, because from the point of view of the sun's image, the mirror is just a dimension, it's a little tiny. So we got a picture of the sun and clouds rolling across it on the uh, side of a house. 50 or 60 yards away. And you enjoy a little movie, right? 
by by just doing this. Now I did this once inside the um, uh, gym of a high school. It turned all the lights out, and then there was a little crack above the door, and I held a piece of paper up and the sun's image with clouds moving around it like a little movie were projected on this piece of paper. Some grade 12 students came and were standing around watching. Everyone assumed that I was holding a laptop and was showing a movie on a laptop. But then when it ended and someone turned on the lights of the gym, everyone was just astonished to see that I was holding a single sheet of paper and nothing more. So, um, and if you're really clever, you can find out the size of the sun by measuring the distance between the, the, uh, the, uh, the images thrown right, and the width of the image. So that makes a triangle, which is a similar triangle to a big triangle going up all the way to the sun. So if you didn't know the size of the sun, you could calculate that. Or if you knew the size of the sun, but didn't know the distance, you could calculate that, right? one unknown. So that's something to do with a purse mirror. Right? And uh, so you see, we're not talking about big expenditures of money to do astronomy. You can do, do lots of things just by yourself. Well, <clears throat> another thing that's going to be coming up soon is um, there's going to be a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. And you might have heard something in the media about this. It's, uh, what happens is Jupiter and Saturn go around and around the sky, and they're like cars on a racetrack going around and around. Jupiter is a fast car going around in 10 years. Saturn slowpoke and goes around in about 30 years. So every 20 years, Jupiter catches up to Saturn and passes it, right? And so that's going to happen in the next couple of months, right? So last time it happened was in 2000, and the last and the time before that, 1980, in January, they passed each other. So this will happen again. So what happens is, if you look um, at sundown, standing looking south on your right-hand side, and uh, try to find a place that's relatively flat where, where the mountains of the middle part of Vancouver Island aren't sticking up and getting in your way, then um, you'll see there's two objects at sundown who are very close together. One's very bright, that's Jupiter, and then to the left is Saturn, which looks like an ordinary star. It's not quite as bright. Over the next couple of months, they'll get closer and closer together. Right? Because Jupiter will be overtaking Saturn, and on the 21st of December, it will pass it. Now, it'll be very low at that time, and it's kind of difficult to observe, but you can get sort of a feel for this, that right now, you can see both of them at the same time in the field of view of a binocular. So take your binoculars. When the sun goes down, it begins to get dark. Hunt around, find Jupiter, that shines out first, and then look to the left of it to see Saturn. And you can fit them both in the same field of view. Uh, because they're, they're now about five degrees apart, but they will shrink uh, and get very close together so that at the end of the year, they will be only about a degree apart or even less. So, um, it, so it should be possible at that time, if you have a telescope, to see Ju the ring of Saturn and Jupiter and its moons all at the same time in the same small field of view, about the uh, size of the full moon in the sky. Um, if you don't have such things, they'll look like they're really close together, kind of like a, a double planet. Right. Anyway, this would be kind of a cool thing. And it reminds us <clears throat> that everything in space is in motion. Right? The stars are moving and uh, the planets are moving and going around each other. And so all of these things happen in patterns. Sometimes the patterns are broken up, like comets come out of the blue and you can't uh, predict when that's going to happen. But many of the things that happen in the sky are kind of periodical. The sky <clears throat> looks like a big ball. If we're standing outside it, I have a ball here. This is the, <clears throat> this is called the celestial sphere, right? So it's just a ball and on the ball is the, the surface of the sky where all the stars sit. And it looks like a ball and it turns around in one day in the exact middle of that ball, if I take this, this apart, in the exact middle is the Earth. It's like sitting right in there. There's the Earth right in the middle. We are there. So we see the stars projected on a surface. Now, if I collapse the sphere, then we have a circle, which would look kind of like this. So there's the circle with the stars on it. The black line inside, that's the part of the sky that's visible. 
And the other part is the part of the sky that's invisible, that's behind the mountains or below the horizon or something like that. A simpler one is the handy planet sphere. And these things are pretty common. In fact, if you go to the National Research Council website, you can download one and make one yourself. Um, there's a template and you just print it out on a printer. And then taking um, some stiff cardboard, right? Glue the thing onto the cardboard, cut it out with scissors and make it. So again, we're doing stuff homemade. We're not uh, relying on high tech uh, stuff or, or big budgets. How this works is that <clears throat> I take the planisphere and I turn it to the current date. So I'm turning it around to late October. And there we go. And then I'm uh, putting it at say, well, say one, a, well, say uh, 11 p.m. So it's late October, 11 p.m. And this is the sky we see. The south, north, east, and west are indicated. So you hold it up. It's used like this up above your head with the compass points in the right direction. And then it will show the stars in the nighttime sky. In the west, we have Vega, Deneb, and Eltair. That's the summer triangle. So there are three fairly bright stars and they're now going down. At about Halloween, they start to set and go down because the summer sky is retreating. And on the other side of the sky, up is coming the winter stars. And in the winter stars, the main man is Orion the hunter. So he's a, he's a big hunter, um, like a, a star man with three stars in his belt. Right? And then a big star above called Betelgeuse, a star with a funny name, I didn't make it up. And then Rigel is a bluish star at the bottom. If you have your homemade telescope, turn the telescope to the bright stars and you'll see they're not all the same. The bright stars are colored. In fact, they all are, just that um, because stars are tiny, it's hard to see the color of a, of a small object. But um, if you magnify the scene with your telescope, then you'll be able to uh, to, to pick out the colors. Some stars are reddish, some are blue. Now you might think, well, that's fun, you know, that some stars are different colors. Are there, one well, a child asked me, are there any polka dot stars? Mm, don't think so, no, I haven't, haven't seen one like that, no. They're all the same color uh, pretty much, unless there are sunspots on them and that's a bit darker, but they're one color. Now, what do the colors mean? Well, the colors are key to the temperatures of the objects. So objects that are, uh, or stars that are reddish are cooler and stars that are blue are hot. So this seems sort of backwards from our normal understanding of temperatures. Usually we associate red with red hot, like an element on a stove, that's hot. And blue we associate with cold, right? People say, I'm, I feel cold, I'm so blue, boo hoo hoo. Right, stuff like that. So, and, but, but that's not how it works in nature. No, no, no. Blue flames are much hotter than red flames. It's just that our experience of the temperatures is a low range. The uh, the, the range of a of a stove, right? It doesn't it isn't a lot, right? It's only a few hundreds of, of degrees. So, the blue stars are really the hot ones, and the red stars are the cool ones. Now, the output of light of a star is determined largely by its temperature. So the blue stars have a big advantage. We'll see more of them um, than red stars. In fact, if all the stars were the same size, right, about the size of the sun, then we wouldn't see very many red stars at all. Only blue stars because the blue stars give out more light. It's proportional to the fourth power of their temperature. So T to the fourth for those uh, <clears throat> um, uh, who are uh, uh, exponent uh, uh, savvy. Okay, so T to the fourth, that means if your temperature is high, that means you're going to be very, very um, hot and giving a, a great output of energy. Because as you know, if you raise any number to the fourth power, it's going to get big. Five to the fourth power is 525, right? So that's, so it gets big quickly. So the red stars are at a disadvantage. We shouldn't see them at all, but we do. There's Betelgeuse, um, Antares in the summer sky. There is um, Aldebaran, which is a red star, right? And currently near the planet Mars. Well, um, so we do see these red stars. Why? Well, it's because there's a second factor that gives the stars visibility. The temperature, well, we've, we've settled that. It's, temp it's high is, is, is bright, low is not so bright, but it's also size. The size of the star is also a determinant. So if the uh, red star, which has its wimpy little temperature, not very much, 
If that star is really, really big, then it will shine out just because there's, there's a lot of surface area of the star. And so this is what's called a red giant. So red giant stars are reddish stars of a very huge size. So Betelgeuse is much bigger than the sun. In fact, if it were in the solar system, it would extend out um, almost, uh, well, past the uh, radius of the uh, orbit of the planet Venus. So it's a massive, huge star. So any star you see that's colored, that seems to be reddish or orange or some such variant, it must be a giant star. Otherwise, you couldn't see it at all. So red stars that are uh, sun-sized are, are, are faint and need telescopes to view them. So <clears throat> the stars have different um, colors, and they can be appreciated with the smallest optical aid. Well, something else that, um, <clears throat> that we should uh, probably look at is maybe um, a couple of deep sky objects. So deep sky objects. There's an easy one to find, and that's by looking in, in the constellation Cassiopeia. So the constellation Cassiopeia right now is in the um, uh, north and uh, east part of the sky. It looks like the letter W in the sky. And if you find the three stars that make a, an equilateral triangle, they're all equal spaced, they point and they point down into the constellation of Andromeda. And that's where the Andromeda galaxy is. So when you look there, you don't see very much. But if you take the little telescope, there we go, and look there, you'll see a kind of a smudge of light. It's like a, um, uh, it's like a lozenge, right, that's faint and foggy. It's like a little itty bitty cloud with a tiny cloud around it. And I've seen it very well in, uh, uh, in, in places where it's nice and dark. And I guess that's the next thing. If you're in the Cowichan Valley or anywhere within the, uh, within the uh, locale uh, of the central part of Vancouver Island, you're in a place where you can see the stars a lot better. In Kitsilano here, I'm in a big disadvantage because there's so many city lights here that I have a hard time seeing the stars, but you probably have a better chance. If you go to the end of the block or to a nearby park or maybe just outside, um, you'll maybe be able to see a lot more stars than I can because it's not near huge urban areas. So that's a big advantage. <clears throat> if you can see Milky Way, which runs through the um, southern, uh, through the summer triangle and is in the west part of the sky, then that's, that's a great place to observe. You'll see many more things more clearly. And had a great view of the uh, Andromeda galaxy uh, last time uh, was when I was at Lac Lejeune Provincial Park. So that's uh, south of Kamloops. So it's very dark there. Uh, there are no city lights. And uh, so I got out late at night with my binoculars and uh, checked out the Andromeda galaxy. And it looked like a little, little uh, button of light with a faint fog around it. Now, <clears throat> another object to look at, which is a little, even a little bit e easier, is the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. That's a little bucket of stars. It looks like a, a tiny collection of a dozen or so stars or in, in a good dark night, you can see 20 or 30 in binoculars. So that's a star cluster. And it's one of the nearest star clusters to us. So it, it looks big and uh, it doesn't need much optical aid. So binoculars are fine uh, for this object, even opera glasses. And in fact, when I used to work at um, the Macmillan Space Center, I did uh, laser light shows. Remember the Pink Floyd laser light shows? I don't know if anyone so, you know, maybe if people had a, a misspent youth, maybe you saw a laser light show. I might have been the operator of that. Uh, but anyway, at uh, night, about midnight, we got our shift. So I would walk home and I would carry in my pocket a pair of opera glasses that only magnified about four times. They were tiny. And I wrapped them in a handkerchief, put them in my pocket, and I'd walk home. And then I'd stop and take a look at the Pleiades and see how many I could count. I usually count 15 or 20 of them, just with the tiny opera glasses that are far, far smaller and less effective than a pair of uh, binoculars. If you have a pair of birders uh, binoculars, or if you have a spotter scope that's used for birding, that makes a great handy little telescope. Turn it to its lowest power, not the highest power, Right, that gives the widest field of view and makes it easier to center and find objects. Right? So um, that's, that's a good thing to have. I, I know I've, I've visited a few places. <clears throat> um, like We have some friends in 150 Mile House. It's really dark up there. And they have a spotter scope to look at birds uh, at the pond nearby. And I asked them about that. I said, do you ever take it outside and look at the sky? They said, oh, no, no, never do that. Never do that. I thought, 
How could you not do that? Um, <clears throat> because it's just so dark out there. So take advantage of the fact that uh, urban areas are at some distance and um, check out some of these highlights. Now, you might say, well, Bill, you know, <clears throat> that's fine. I'm hearing this, but what about resources? Like, where can I go to get more, more stuff? Well, you know what? Guess what? The library. The library has books on astronomy, right? 520 is the call number in nonfiction of astronomy books. So there's probably planospheres. There may even be a globe of the earth, of the stars in the library. So your first uh, visit should be to your library to find out some more things about this. Pick up a book on the stars, pick up a book on the planets, right? Maybe an observer's book, right? Um, there are many, many topics. There's also astronomy magazines. Um, as well, that uh, might be uh, might be carried at like Sky and Telescope, might be carried at the library. Um, so these things are can give you a, a smattering of uh, of objectives when you go outside. And I think it's important to have an objective when you go outside. Just don't go outside and then look casually around, you know, waiting for something to happen. Um, have a sort of a plan as to what to do. Uh, and of course, it can be as simple as going outside when it's sunny, but the sun is behind clouds and projecting an image of the sun onto the side of a house and seeing the clouds race by. All right, so it could be as simple as that, but have some sort of plan. And if you really, uh, uh, really want to get into it, then things like drawing objects can be made. So if you have any skill as an artist or even a little bit, you can make a drawing of the moon showing its craters and things like that. So um, I sometimes do that. I, I find a nice tree and I draw the tree um, in pencil. And then when the moon comes by, I go to night, you can't see the tree, but I know where the moon will be. So I go outside and then I sketch the moon as seen through a telescope and make moon drawings. And some people even uh, take on more difficult objects like the planet Mars. So um, if you're, um, if you're interested in doing that, probably the best place to go is to YouTube <clears throat> and then type in um, drawing astronomical bodies, right? And then you'll, you'll, you'll see lots of examples and pointers on how to do this. <clears throat> I haven't mentioned the planet Mars, but that's um, in the sky right now. So I, I shouldn't um, finish without talking about Mars. Mars looks kind of orange or golden in color, and it's quite high in the sky as uh, as it gets dark and it's uh, quite bright. So it stands out more than the other bodies around it. Over the next couple of months, Mars will move slowly around. The planets move around the sun, whereas the stars have their fixed addresses. They're called the fixed stars. So they're not, uh, they're not uh, immobile, but uh, uh, they do tend to have their patterns. So the Big Dipper is always looking dipperish. The stars of the Big Dipper don't get scattered and go flying away to have holidays in some other constellation. They're always in the same place. <clears throat> so if you take your planisphere out and uh, take a look at the constellations, then tell yourself maybe uh, to learn two constellations every night. That's pretty easy. Right? And by getting uh, a good look at the constellations, then you'll uh, be able to understand where these other things are coming and going. And you'll notice that the moon doesn't just fly through the sky in a, a random pattern. The moon goes through the sky along a narrow uh, line called the ecliptic, right? And the ecliptic is the solar system laid out flat. So the moon's path is through the 12 signs of the zodiac, and it never leaves that place. So you've never seen the moon going through the Big Dipper. Can't get there. And it has to be um, in its uh, track or route around the sky and not, uh, not some other place. So um, I guess to conclude, the, um, you know, astronomy has been, uh, I guess, part of my life since I was a teenager and I got interested in it and uh, soon, you know, got a few books and uh, a planisphere, a book of the stars and a little telescope. At first I had to make my, tele my telescopes out of things like uh, magnifying glasses and things like that, they weren't very good. But, um, if you have uh, just a little bit of time and a little bit of craftiness, you can make yourself a telescope or a uh, or a uh, or find a pair of binoculars or field glasses, uh, maybe in the back of the drawer where you haven't looked for a few years. They might you might find them hiding there. Take them out, dust them off, 
and uh, take them outside at night and look at the nighttime sky. So I know that if you do, you're going to have some marvelous experiences because you're in just the place to do that. And so um, as, I, as I began by saying, I really miss uh, Raft River Park and uh, Miracle Beach and Pacific Rim. And I wish I could, um, I wish I could have come in the summer with my telescope and set up there. But unfortunately, um, uh, that wasn't to be. But that doesn't mean your astronomy need come to a halt. You can do all this yourself. As I said, first trip, go to the library, find a little bit more, and then go outside and see what's up. Well, thanks very much for, uh, for viewing this. And thank you for the library. And thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you guys are interested in other videos from Vancouver Island Regional Library, please check out our YouTube channel or visit our library website at virl.bc.ca. And like Bill said, take a look on there, maybe find some few new uh, star, star maps or books about stars on there. And thanks again, Bill, for joining us.